And they told me I didn't say my name. <clears throat> so I'll have to say my name first. So, Bob Kahn. The question I have actually uh, goes to how you'll come up with the capital to enable the technology transfer. And you mentioned that you don't have a Bayh-Dole Act, and that turned out to be a very crucial uh, step in the creation of American venture capital. Uh, I've gotten into that business, and I've learned as a result of it, it actually is, was transformed by two things. One was the Bayh-Dole Act. But the other was um, to make available capital without holding those who provided the capital fiduciarily responsible for high-risk investments that went bad. Uh, that is deeply fundamental. And it came out in 1979. And so if you look at American venture capital spending in terms of our investment, it was actually very small prior to 1980. And it's now about $20 billion a year in new venture creation. So the question about policy is the following with respect to India. One will be the equivalent of the Bayh-Dole Act. But the other is that there is a great deal of wealth being created in India. And those will end up in institutions, foundations, endowments, pension funds, and all the rest that will then look to reinvest, not just elsewhere, but in India. And when they do so, a portion of the portfolio allocation will be high risk. And what's needed and what happened in 1979 in the U.S. was that pension funds, for example, and pension fund managers uh, or mutual funds would not be held liable if they dedicated, let's say, 5 or 10 percent of their portfolio asset to high risk ventures in which one in 10 might succeed. Now, the one in 10 could turn out to be a Qualcomm or it could turn out to be a Sun Microsystem or a Microsoft. But they were not held liable for the nine that failed. And it was a very, very important element. In India, are you taking account of these pillars that underpin why we have been able in 25 years to do the venture capital industry that we now have? Before you answer, let me just comment, Bob. I want you to expand a little on that. I mean, I'm obviously very familiar with the history of the Baidol bill. But the legislation in 1979, what was behind that? How did okay, that um, right. It was actually something done that very few people know about. It came out of the Carter administration. And it was, in effect, um, there were lawsuits against many of the pension funds that prevented them from effectively putting money to work in higher risk ventures. And uh, it was actually a ruling, an executive order that effectively said a pension fund manager, is it like a rule, right, uh, an accounting rule? It said a, a manager would not be held fiduciarily irresponsible if they made a class of investments in an asset class of high risk, so long as that was part of a balanced portfolio. And it, it was something that came out of Treasury in, uh, in 79. And without it, no pension fund manager would have put money to work in a firm like ours, or anybody on Sand Hill Road. I just have to say that, you know, I've always considered Baidol absolutely critical. I've never been quite aware of that other feature. Well, uh, Baidol just enabled the university piece. Yeah. And but the university piece was really critical. Very but, interesting part of history. But five out of six or eight out of ten new ventures don't come out of the university. They come out of the larger companies that had an entrepreneurial beginning and then people sort of spin out from companies. And that portion is where most of the money gets spent, in fact. Yeah, thanks for the uh, comment. And that's, I think, a very important uh, bit of uh, learning. Uh, one of the reasons uh, I said that uh, Baidol or a similar kind of legislation was only an enabler was that really it is these other elements which need to be put in place before it will have an, have an intended effect. And it's very much the case that, uh, that so I, I would really say just two things. Uh, first, um, I agree completely with you that there is a need to have uh, an enabler which allows for uh, managers, uh, fund managers, to be able to actually look at this high-risk segment. The second is also, I think, a little bit more uh, India-specific, which is we need a class of um, 
intelligent investors. If you look at some of the early venture capital industry in India, it was largely sort of financial institution based. Uh, I think we also need a class of people uh, who have who have a much more deeper personal understanding of a technology, uh, of what technology finance and early stage technology finance or venture finance is. Who who, so in a way, you need two things. You need an enabler which allows you to create that source of funds, but you also need a set of people who really understand the nuances of that particular class of investments that you want to pursue. Otherwise, you will, you you know, you will not have uh, the kind of ventures that you would like to see coming out from the technology space. I've been told that we have uh, four more minutes left, so hopefully we get this question and maybe one more. Hi, I'm Sandy Chandra from Mascon Global in India. I've been associated with this initiative from Amrita University as part of their team. The concerns that I have about India, having lived there for almost 20 years now, having gone back from the U.S., is none of the entrepreneurial institutions that have come up, especially in the high technology areas, the large ones, None of them inculcate a habit of further entrepreneurship. Not one additional company has come out, not to my knowledge, from any of these companies. And in fact, they do not allow for any of them to branch out and start businesses. As opposed to, in the past, in the 60s, you had some of the public sector companies in India which created enormous amount of entrepreneurship. In fact, the high technology industry in India does not, uh, and it's, it's also, if you look at TIFAX functioning, and if you see and participate in some of the meetings, I also see that uh, very little of industry participation is taking place. Even if it is so, it's very limited, and it does not fund any of these operations. Your comments, Mr. Patwal. Yeah, there's sort of two kinds of uh, questions that you've posed, I think. The first is a bigger question, which is, you know, in what way uh, what are the sources? And one of the things I mentioned earlier, which I think is going to be an important route in the Indian context, is really the route of uh, getting entrepreneurship coming out through the academia, through the academic system. Uh, you talked about public sector units. You talked about private sector. Uh, I think that uh, one of the things we have to try and do much more strongly is, uh, you know, trying to create a more entrepreneurial environment coming out of campus, and this might involve different kinds of interventions um, of, of all kinds. I mean, it's not just about money, but it's also about creating a certain uh, environment which stimulates uh, new, new uh, venture creation. Uh, the second, in terms of uh, industry involvement, I think it really at one level, it really varies. Um, areas where we are specifically looking at uh, industry involvement, I think the answer to that is that there are some sectors uh, where industry, uh, you know, in a way, to plant a seed, you have to have uh, a reasonably uh, fertile soil. And there's some sectors in industry where that soil is fertile and where we see that there, we do see a much stronger participation and involvement of industry. For example, we have a program on automotive R&D, uh, which many in this uh, group uh, know of, where there has been a much stronger involvement of industry. And that's because th there is a certain stage uh, at which the industry is also receptive. So the, uh, the problem of translating capabilities and outputs is not just on one side, it's also on the other side. And uh, and where that is happening, you do see a very different picture than you may in some other areas. I've been told that we have just one minute left, actually less than a minute now. Um, she's keeping a very close eye on it. We've, we've got four questions here. Let's see if we can get them. Because you're, you've got one question. You may not get the answer, though. You <laughs> <laughs> may get we'll the answer in the break. We'll be taking off the stage. <laughs> Uh, I am Ravindra from Infosys. Uh, I have a question for Anand. This is with regard to the uh, scalability in education. Essentially, if you really look at it, we have about 495,000 students pursuing their engineering degree on an annualized basis. 
But if you really look at the number of colleges across which this is spread, that's something like 1,400 uh, colleges, the faculty is a serious uh, kind of a question, quality of faculty. I agree, technology can reach out some of it, but not everything can be learned in a quality manner or effective manner through technology. You need face-to-face, -face, especially during that important uh, undergrad level. What is that one can do in terms of really enabling the faculty on the one side? The other is the differential salary that exists today between the industry and the academia within India. If that is not addressed, it does not attract good talent into the academics. And as the head of education and research in Infosys, I know what it means. Okay? And that needs to be addressed. Is there something built into this UC and uh, India collaboration agreement that can be addressed through such a means so that we can actually, one, increase the attractiveness of academics as a profession on the one side, two, to create a good community of researchers amongst the people, third, improve the quality of education through the professors, not directly have to get touch the students, because you can't touch the students in all places in the country. Okay, thank That's you. where, in fact, I feel there thank is. You. I think we may be allowed a 30-second response, but there, there is a longer part of the day that we can maybe catch up on some of these things during lunch. Okay, so a very quick uh, response. I think some of these are structural issues that will have to be uh, that will have to be addressed within the Indian context, issues of differential salaries, issues of variable compensation, issues of mobility, how do you get mobility across uh, between, for instance, academia and R&D institutions. You mentioned about industry. Well, we have a huge publicly funded R&D institutional structure in the country which is doing research where you have very well qualified people. So there are, I think, some of these structural issues are sort of beyond the, uh, this particular uh, MOU. But I think where this MOU can really help is, as, is looking at you know, having that sustained engagement, going from uh, better quality research, going to focused technology development, going to some of these new interface institutional structures and models, and really the, some of the new domains where we can use this collaboration to seed uh, entirely new uh, class of uh, work in Indian academia. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know whether Dick or Anand, you have any last comment, comments that you'd like to make? I can make an infinite number of comments, but I... Uh, well, I mean, well, you have to deal with her then. I'm yeah. not going to... I think I'd better not start. <laughs> okay. Well, in any case, let me... There are a number of topics that we didn't really hit upon with this, and I hope that they'll come out during the rest of the meeting. Um, but let me uh, have you join me in thanking the speakers uh, for giving the presentation.